Let's start off with uh, the adventures of Tintin, which I think you know. I think this was going to be. People thought this was the big Spielberg movie to see. Kind of the tables flipped on that a little bit. Like War Horse has been doing a lot better uh, in North since. America. In North America, yes, definitely. Tintin cleaned up overseas, but um, let's uh, take a listen to a clip from the adventures of Tintin. Before he lost consciousness, Dawes tried to tell me something, and I think he was spelling out a word. B O U D J A N. Caribou Jean. Caribou Jean! <laughs> Does that mean anything to you? Great Scotland Yard! Oh, that's extraordinary! What is? Worthington's ever half price sale on bowler hats. Really, Thompson? This is hardly the time. Great Scotland Yard! What is it? Cade's a half price too. Are you going to take charge of this evidence? Positively. Never fear, Tintin. The evidence is safe with us. Hello. Thompson, what are you? Oh, well, I, I'm already downstairs. Do try to keep up. Classic. Uh, the Adventures of Tintin is directed by S- Steven Spielberg. It stars uh, the voices and the performances, I guess, of Jamie Bell, Andy Serkis, Daniel Craig, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, and many others. What did you guys think of The Adventures of Tintin? Who's who's going to speak first? I'll go first. I, I might be alone on this, but I thought it was fantastic. Yeah? Yes. Uh, this was everything that Indiana Jones 4 should have been. Yeah, I mean, th- it definitely has an Indiana Jones feel throughout, and uh, I liked it. I think, like, the scene... Where they like the whole action sequence with the scrolls and the the John Williams music, I thought was excellent. I I liked it. Not I don't think as much as you. I think for me, my biggest problem was the opening, and I thought the opening credits were like really flat and really boring. And <laughs> the, the opening credits were awesome. I didn't like them at all. They I were thought, amazing. I thought the opening credits were great. Oh, I just liked them, and I thought the music was just. It felt like a Saturday. You morning. and your parsley again. <laughs> It felt like a Saturday morning cartoon to me. Not the not the quality, but the uh, the impact. Like it did not get me excited for this movie. It just kind of so it and, got got it off on the kind, wrong foot. Yeah, for that you. kind of feeling carried with me for like the first half an hour or so, and then I felt like it really picked up the last forty five fifty minutes, and I I really enjoyed it then. I will yeah. also say I was very tired when I watched this movie, so I need to rewatch it. I liked it a lot as well. I, mean, I I think the best part of the film was the opening. Yeah? No. <laughs> um, although I know for a while there was a like fan opening credit sequence right. going around on the internet, and everyone was like, this has to be the opening titles, which seems to happen all the time. Someone will do a fan title sequence. Everyone will say it's awesome. It has to be the opening titles. As though they actually think the studio is going to be like, okay, we'll just take this thing this guy made on Vimeo. But didn't and, didn't Spielberg actually contact that guy? I I don't know if I he actually contacted him for this movie, but I'm pretty sure there was a story going around that Spielberg liked it so much he called this guy and asked him to work on something else. I don't know, but the opening titles that were in there blew those titles out of the water. I yeah, I liked the opening credits quite a bit, and I was actually going to make so the point. Long. Well, like, it okay, was, it was but like I mean, fucking seven. It must have been close to five or seven minutes long. Which is why I was thankful that they were awesome. Uh, well, if you <laughs> didn't think, so long. if you didn't think they were awesome, then it was very <laughs> tedious to get through. Well, I was almost going to make the point that like uh, I, I would have liked to see a whole movie in that animation style because I mean, I guess you know one of the things about this movie that's worth discussing is like you know its performance capture. It's, uh, I think, you know, the tech for this movie was very impressive, but, you know, constantly I was, I was asking myself, like, was this the right choice? Like, could this, could this have been live action? Would it have been better live action? Uh, and then on the flip side, like, could it have been better, more traditionally animated? Because, I mean, that's, that's Tintin as people know him from the comics. So, uh, I, I think, um, I think if they were to do it live action, they would have to have the dog still be the motion capture. Which would be CG, retarded. Which would be re- absolutely I, ridiculous. I think that was his justification for doing this, right? I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. I don't know where I, I remember that, reading but. that somewhere that 
the idea of, okay, well, you either make one element CG and it stands out amongst everything else, or you make everything CG and then everything is within the same world, aesthetically. Right. And, I mean, there are things in this movie that I don't think you could have done with the same impact in 2D animation or live action. Like, the best thing in this movie is that single-take action sequence in Morocco. And that could not have been done any other way with the same impact. Uh, yeah, are you talking about the, the motorcycle chase scene or whatever it is? This, yeah, in Morocco, the it's single take. With the scrolls. The giant the single take. Yeah. <clears throat> what I mentioned, yeah. Yeah, I mean... The, the one where, yeah, they're, it's, they're catching the yes, papers. Yeah. And <clears throat> now, I kind of feel like it's a bit of a double-edged sword, though, because I feel like some of the action sequences go a little too far. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, but, they're so... Uh, like complicated and so like so much stuff happening at once that it's almost too much. I disagree. I think that if you're going to do this brand of filmmaking and animation, then you should take advantage of it. I like well, that. That action sequence is the perfect example. Like it, there are things in there that are cartoony, but they're not so cartoony that it's completely distracting, but there are also things that could never be done without it being retarded retard id <laughs> in live action um so this is the like if you're going to do it this way then take advantage of it rather than having a bunch of people being stop or motion capture animated for no reason at all i don't want to sit here and watch it and be like okay why didn't they do it just live action right and i want i, I want to watch something and be like that's why they did it in motion capture Right, and I do think, like you said, I think they justified it. I just think that when given these tools to basically do whatever the hell he wanted, I think like Spielberg kind of went a little overboard. Not that it ruined the movie, but just you know some of those action scenes, and in particular, there's the the one with the plane where they're you know flying and uh, like that just kind of like it got boring to me after a while. It was too long, too much. But that scene in Morocco was perfect, and like. You know, I have no complaints about that. And if every scene was that, you know, spot on, this would be, you know, up there. But I mean, the Morocco scene was probably the most over the top out of them all. Maybe. I, I'm not exactly sure what it is about some of them. Like, I feel like, you know, definitely the, the length of how long these sequences last. And like you said, the cartooniness, there's, there's a balance there that you have to hit. And some of them go too far in one direction. It was also the longest. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to. <laughs> Are you sure about that? I it was pretty think, long. I don't remember it being the longest. Maybe it might not be the it's... longest, but it's pretty long. I mean, it it starts. Maybe it seems long because it's a single take. Right. But I mean, it's a pretty extensive sequence. It has them, you know, him he, him on the motorcycle and then zip lining and the tank on the in the building and right the thing and the stuff and the. I, I mean, I would say that that everything you're complaining about, that sequence represents every single aspect of that. I mean, I, I the, as for the plane sequence, I enjoyed the plane sequence. I thought it was pretty good. Spielberg's the perfect guy for the motion capture, I think. I wouldn't want to see him doing more. Like, I don't watch this and I don't think, okay, I, I want more. I want lots of these. I just think, okay, if you're going to do one, then let's do it and remake jobs. I guess this is <laughs> this is the um, way to do it. I don't know. Well, and I mean, we there is supposedly going to be a trilogy of them, although Spielberg won't be directing the next two, apparently. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I mean, yeah, I guess you know, you're saying Spielberg is the perfect guy to do this stuff. Like, how how do you guys think this compares to all like the Robert Zemeckis stuff? Because he's been doing this for like a decade now. I've only seen Beowulf. And that was okay. But I think that's an example of one that could have been done in live action. Right. Because Beowulf didn't need to be... He could have been CG. He would have been CG. He was CG. <laughs> <laughs> what were his other ones? I'm trying to... I haven't seen Beowulf. I saw... I started watching The Christmas Carol last week and turned it off. Like, I Yeah, really, I, I, saw, I saw a bit of it on TV over the holidays. And I was just surprised at how kind of... By the book, and yeah. Like, it, like it, it's, is. it was a very direct adaptation, and it was like very kind of slow, actually. But even like, there's something about Zemeckis' style too. Like, 
the Bob Cratchit character, like it, it looks a bit like Gary Oldman just from what I saw, but he's like a creepy, like short version of Gary Oldman. Like it doesn't work. Where I, oh, I thought you were talking about Gary Coleman <laughs> <laughs> when you're like a creepy short. Every version, version of Gary Oldman. <laughs> he was creepy Coleman and short. Creepy short. <laughs> but uh, but I like like I love the Captain character in this, and I like that they took the like the performance and it looks nothing like Andy circus from what I can tell. It's just like, it's a character using that performance, right? Where all the other ones I've seen tend to, you know, incorporate some aesthetic. Well, they just put the actor in. Yeah. Like almost. Beowulf, right? yeah. They put Anthony Hopkins in. Well, they, they put, or Anthony, they, they slimmed down Winstone for Beowulf, right? Wolf, right? But, uh, Angelina Jolie was Angelina yeah, that's Jolie. True. And that's what I mean. That's I like that. The, and then that, it makes you think even more. Okay. Why didn't you just absolutely shoot it live? Action? Where this is cool, where everyone looks a certain way and nothing, but, uh, nothing know. like who they are in real life. And the captain to me was probably the best part of the movie. Like I love that character and I thought he was funny. And the other thing I really liked were a lot of the little touches. Like I loved how they introduced Tintin with the portrait mm-hmm. and like crossing that bridge of a comic to, to this movie. And I really liked how the opera singer came into play and how that whole sequence unfolded, like why she was there, why she was a secret weapon and stuff like that. Like all those, you know, adventure elements coming together. Like that's Spielberg stuff that I like. Like it reminds me of, you know, minority report with the umbrellas and Mm -hmm. all that's like stuff like that. And that's, those are my favorite parts of this movie. I'd say. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, you're complaining about some of the movies where they make the actors, the characters look like the actors. And I think a large part of that is just to sell the movie. You know, it's like they have these big stars. They want to show them off. Whereas this is, you know, you've got cartoon characters that are established, have a certain look, and you want to kind of try and stick to that. I, You know, because Tintin kind of sells itself, at least in Europe. So, um but I, I thought it was kind of interesting, like Nick Frost and Simon Pegg do the voices for Thompson and Thompson, and I knew that, and as I'm watching the movie, I, I couldn't even picture them doing the voice. Like, their voices did not sound like them. I mean, clearly they were, you know, different accents and whatever, but, uh, you know, the same for Andy Serkis. Like, I knew he was Captain Haddock, but I could not really picture him in there in that performance. So I, I don't know if that's good or bad or if that's you know a a tribute to the the actors themselves or what it is but it's the first time that i've kind of had that with an animated movie like this usually they want to push you know the connection between who the actors are and those characters and i also don't think that this movie is directly comparable to robert zemeckis's films in terms of the the motion capture style and technology like I'd say this is more in line with Gollum and uh, Caesar and Rise of the Planet of the Apes and King Kong. Like they're creating characters that, again, don't look anything like the actors. And yes, they're human, but they give them very exaggerated, cartoony traits. Um, I think the only one that really looks the most realistic, I guess, is Tintin. Um, but I mean, everyone else is is quite obviously not human. Whereas with Zemeckis's films, he just tries to make everyone look real, and I think that's where the creepy thing comes into play. Like I didn't, I didn't find anything creepy in this movie. I know a lot of people complain about that, but it it just seems like the stock complaint about this stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, there is definitely that you know, uncanny valley thing going on in the sense that, you know, when you see sort of far shots of things, you could almost think that they're real. But I don't know if it's just that the technology has improved or I think more likely what it is, is like you're saying, they kind of realize, well, this is a cartoon, you know, we're going to make it feel cartoony still. And it kind of counterbalances that. Like they didn't go 100% photorealistic and that kind of works. I think they did with the backgrounds though. And I think that's, a, a cool blend of things that makes it work. Like when there's like the far shot in Morocco, I think it might've been the establishing shot when you see like, like the smoke and how that looked like that looked amazing to me. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now what did you guys think about like another interesting thing about this movie that I was looking forward to is, you know, the script is co-written by Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish. And like, do you guys feel like that translated into the movie? Did you see that in there or, like, I didn't. 
Not really. No. I, yeah, I was a little disappointed with that just because it felt very much like this is a kid's movie, you know? And I was kind of hoping that there would be some, you know, little snippets of clever dialogue here and there. And I enjoyed But I mean, it. Tintin is the main you know goal right it, it, the the goal you hire those two guys and nobody knows who they are outside of you know cinephiles the the point of hiring them is just to write a tintin story so i wouldn't expect it to be very of their other work aside from just having maybe some good humor in it well, I mean, the fact that Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are actually doing voices, too. I mean, you couldn't not right, but think. You, but you, you said yourself. You, didn't, you couldn't tell right, it was exactly. them. Exactly, and so. that's, that's what I'm saying. That's is the that, point. It's like you don't want them to show up as those two guys and be recreating a moment, like nodding to, to you know, Shaun of the Dead or something directly to the audience when 98% of the people at this movie won't even know what you're talking about. And the rest of them, it's like, well... It'd be kind of just weird, cheap pandering. But I mean, not that I'm saying that the only way to tell if they wrote the script and their their you know stamp is on it is just direct nods or or references. I couldn't really tell much just in general. Like j- even with the humor, the humor was fine, but it wasn't like it was like broad humor for yeah. Like, but again, it's a kids movie, so uh, yeah, I, I get that. But I didn't find any of it really funny at all i i kind of liked thompson and thompson and i mean i've read a little bit like i i read a bit of the tintin secret of the unicorn comic and it seemed like it was a pretty you know like almost word for word at times adaptation so i mean maybe they're just you know tintin fans they came in and they did the job and that's fine um but you know i just think it's worth pointing out because you know some people have been talking about the fact that those guys wrote the script and i don't you know it's just don't necessarily expect anything from that. And that, that could have been their pitch almost, or like a faithful recreation. Like everything now that's a remake of something seems to either have, you know, a comedy twist, especially like talking about old TV shows. It's like turn an old TV show into a comedy now, and that seems to be the way to do it every time. And right. it's getting kind of boring. It's refreshing that they just like kind of played it straight with Tintin, and I'm guessing we're pretty faithful to the source material. Yeah, uh, one other thing, too. I mean, talking about whether or not this is a kid's movie or not, I mean, obviously it is. But, like, one thing I was kind of pleasantly surprised about is, like, I mean, Tintin, you know, he he carries a gun, you know? Like, there's not, it's not like that, like, there's still a sense of danger there. It's not so cartoony that it's like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, this guy's obviously going to get away with whatever he's doing. Like, it's, there is still some threat there which i thought was kind of cool and the captain's boozing all the time <laughs> that too yeah that was a little bit surprising which is interesting coming from a guy who just like what 10 15 years ago digitally removed all the guns and from et like obviously he's had a it seems like at that point he was slightly influenced by maybe his kids being young and and the things that other filmmakers were doing and and gave into the the urge to manipulate his work but now he he just seems to be back to being a little more open minded about the stuff. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like his main character in the kids' film, who is also a young adult, is carrying a gun. Right. And I think, you know, he even said himself that he regrets he the, the, out. the ET thing. So, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it is kind of a, an interesting blend of like because you know at times it, it could pass for a live action movie um what do you guys think of like you were talking earlier about the dog like do you feel like the dog is a little too like again there's it it varies between cartoony and somewhat feasible but i think you know there's a lot of things the dog does that are pretty over the top i thought the dog was fine no issues i never that? thought that the dog was supposed to be anything other than a cartoon character I never looked at the dog and thought, oh, that's supposed to represent a real dog and only have the abilities of a real dog. Like, the whole thing to me felt like a cartoon. Right. And ultimately, this is a story about a boy and And his his dog. dog. (laughs) Yeah. But, I mean, like, it is still set 
sort of in a real world, right? Like, aside from a dog that can do some crazy things and some action sequences that are a little over the top, I mean, it's not, it's not a fantasy world. So well, I think it's set in a real it's, world. But it's a it's characterized. Still a cartoon. It's a characterized version of reality. Like some of the stuff that goes on, it's. I would say it's more a cartoon. Okay. Like the same way Ninja Turtles is a takes place in the real world. Okay. Or GI Joe. I mean, sure. sure, it doesn't have a lot of supernatural stuff or. You know, uh, f- when you say set in the real world, I assume you mean there are there's nothing right, otherworldly, yeah. but right. it's still a cartoon. Like the the physics are cartoony, and the the characters are car- cartoony, and right. Okay. Uh, any other uh, thoughts? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, I thought the. Um when the captain is remembering his past and the st- or not his past, but the story of his ancestors, I thought that the, the pirate ship sequence was also amazing. See, that was another sequence. I w- wasn't a big fan of, I don't know why. I don't know if it's it just, it seems like I'm you were of- watching it in, in a reality. And whenever things that were cartoony, it took you out. Maybe I, maybe I like to me, I, I was thinking maybe I'm just sick of seeing so much pirate stuff, but but I like the idea of this guy having to get drunk to remember these things. That was cool. But, but you know, actual... when when the ships, I mean, with you know, not spoiling too much, when they connected the masts, right? And, you know, and the one ship is turned the opposite way and it's swinging above the other one. I thought that like looked a, awesome. Like a pirate ship ride at a museum. Yeah, it looked right? awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, let's go back to the credits I mean, for a second. It, just <laughs> before, that's the thing. Like that, this movie is set pieces, and Spielberg is a master at set pieces. And this is an opportunity for him to take it to a level that he couldn't take previously in live action. So, right, and that's I agree, and I think that it just it, he got carried away. It's just an overload of Spielberg set pieces. I enjoyed most of them. Some of them, not as much, but. You know, again, the the idea of this movie, like like you're saying, sort of Indiana Jones meets like like a Scooby Doo kind of thing. I mean, that's I if, when I was a kid, I would have like blown my load over this thing. So, <laughs> man, fatherhood has changed you. Yeah, apparently. Uh, okay, back to the credits. Credits. Yeah. So that this is, I would say, my biggest problem with the opening credits is the sound of the opening credits. Two things. One, I don't think the score it represents an action adventure movie at all. It feels more like... I think it represents a detective. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's really that many detective elements to this movie? Do you think that's a selling feature? Isn't Tintin a detective? He is, but does that <laughs> does that well, come across in the he's, movie? He's a journalist. He's a journalist. Right? And I, really, at the end of the movie, they tie it in like, I was wondering, why is Tintin doing this? And then it's like, well, I got the gold and you got your story. <laughs> like, I think Tintin I, I never is felt- a detective as much as Indiana Jones is an archaeologist. Mm. Yeah. You're telling me Indiana Jones is an archaeologist throughout all of Indiana Jones? <laughs> a little bit. He is yeah. a teacher, I, you know, but I, I think that's a good comparison. But, well, in terms of comparing Indiana Jones, like the score in Indiana Jones, like. Magic. Right, but it's a classic. Okay, but. There are, and there isn't and, really an opening title sequence. Right, but the opening sequence definitely sets up the movie better. Right, like, because it, it's just storytelling. I right. mean, it, I, I would say that they're. Different. I, I think this sequence was comparable to Catch Me If You Can. I agree. And I, exact, that's exactly what I was going to say. And Catch Me If You Can is not the same kind of movie as Tintin. Like this, the credits do not match the movie to me at all. But, but Tintin is a, a comic book. I can already tell if those are the other credits someone made, that looks brutal right there. <laughs> that picture of the captain looks awful. I'm out. But <laughs> you haven't even but, seen it in motion. Um, the uh, the other thing is, it was weird in the sense like of the comic book panels, like it was just the score, right? Like I think if there would have been because there's all these actions happening in the comic panels, but there's no sound to match it. Like it felt weird. Like I felt like part of the audio track was missing. Like I was like, is there like is the projector set up right? Like if it felt weird. Did you guys find that at all? Like no. No, it just. I don't uh, think so. No, I thought. Oh, it was. I thought it was awful. Just as <laughs> awful a, as a package. Like, <laughs> you know what the opening credits remind me of is the opening credits for Catch Me If You Can. No doubt. <laughs> so I mean, 
that point was already brought up. I think when you sorry, when I was I was looking up this. Were, I apologize. Yeah. But I mean, I think I see your point that it doesn't feel like an adventure. And type okay, to answer book. to rebut that the same way I did with Jay, does is this the same kind of movie as Catch Me If You Can? Mm. No, not I, th- I think the credits for Catch Me If You Can <laughs> are better too. I would say. Yeah, I think they're better, but I think they're more just trying to to set you up for that sort of era, that era that the of the film. That, sure, and, and I don't think the credits and it being the, kind of a con- uh, uh, like they, they remind me of like Pink Panther or something right. like that, which I think is in the realm of Tintin. Like, I don't know. didn't do it for me. I mean, it hurt the movie for me big time. The the question of big time <laughs> again the parsley the the question of Tin Tin being a detective he does detective work through the throughout the whole film he has a magnifying glass he must be a detective he's constant the clip you just played that clip Frank are you telling me that's not detective work it is okay. I just I'm not saying he's, <laughs> he's not he's detective I never once said he's not a detective I said I felt like his motivation and his need to solve this thing like wasn't there at all. It's just like well, his motivation to solve this thing is entirely driven by his need to detect. <laughs> I mean, on. I would I would say you that's feel one Tintin thing. Had a burning desire to detect that you felt watching this movie. Well, yeah, I would totally. I would the, say the, his his main motivation is just the lure of. A, a mystery. The one, the there was one whole scene at the beginning where it showed all the newspaper articles of all the, the things that he had solved and all the cases he had broken. Sure, I mean, it came across that he definitely is a detective. And you know, once that someone stole his ship, he's going to figure I out who the took it. They broke into his apartment or whatever. Like I think that's kind of they established in. he was a detective at the beginning with the credits. <laughs> he does do detective work here and there, like he pieces together what's going on. But what is what is Tintin's motivation for for this adventure? I honestly don't know. The draw of a mystery. <laughs> I guess is that. Did you I, really feel that though? I know we're I saying that, and we're saying that's what it was, and I, can I mean, agree that that's what it is. But did you really get that sense? Yeah, one hundred percent. Based on the fact that I mean, I haven't read a Tintin comic, but the opening title sequence is him running around. It, I, I'm assuming. It's setting up like previous adventures of Tintin. I'm assuming. I haven't read the so, comics. And then when you open, again, you get the, the newspaper articles. Like the only real character stuff that you get with from Tintin is that, is that he's drawn to mysteries. And with that boat, I, I mean, I could see how people could argue that it's he's a shallow character because all he does is he buys this boat, realizes there's there's something strange about it. And investigates it and gets caught up in the investigation, and that's it. the The main character is I, the captain. I well, absolutely. Actually, there is one other thing that is different in the comic that may have made it a little easier for you, Frank. Which is that he actually knows <laughs> he knows Captain Haddock at the beginning of the comic, and he buys the boat for him, and so it's a gift for his friend. And then it gets stolen, and he wants to get it back, basically, so he can give this gift to his friend. So I don't know if that would have helped at all, but. But I mean, the whole time, all he's doing is saying, well, why would they want this? Why were they looking for this? Why did they break into my room? What is this thing? I have to figure this out. Like, I don't, that's, you didn't, you don't think so? You don't think that he did that? I need to see it again, obviously. (laughs) But I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. (laughs) So the question is, can an opening credit sequence ruin a movie? It didn't ruin it. (laughs) Like, I'm going to give this a very favorable review. I like the movie. But okay. I thought it could have started out with some punch for an adventure movie. <laughs> I loved the fruit punch at the beginning of this movie. It was Hawaiian punch. Got you right in the mouth. Moroccan punch. Yeah. Nothing better at the end of a long, hard day than a nice, warm glass of Hawaiian punch. <laughs> One thing that was uh, at at the beginning of the movie that I also thought was kind of cool was the, uh, the the idea of the guy painting the picture of Tintin, and it actually looks like the comic book Tintin, and then you see the <laughs> cartoony version. Was this already discussed as yeah. well? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. You Never weren't surfing that. the internet at that point, I don't think. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see a bit of these credits, Hotshot. <laughs> let's see what you did. Let's see what you put together here. All right. Did you do this, Sean? Yeah. What do you guys think? 
sound. I do think the score is a better fit. Would you agree? No. Fuck you. For this, because there's not... I, I okay, assume yeah, it fits yeah. this better. I but. mean, just f- for the movie. To match the movie. Not looking at mean? the credits. Just does this represent the feel of... But I thought the score in the film was good. Yeah, so did I. Except for the opening credits. Right, but the opening credits are I know, setting it, him up as a detective. It, just, it, it feels completely disjoint from the movie to me. Like, that's... Okay. It's okay. So, do you prefer these or the uh, <clears throat> the ones you actually saw? I don't know. It does say I, here I that the he music was, better here. It does say here that he was offered a job on Spielberg's next project. So, whatever that means, maybe he'll do the credits. Coffee for, bringer. Right. <laughs> maybe he'll do the credits for Robopocalypse. I don't know. All right. Any other thoughts? Daniel Craig as the bad guy. <laughs> Any. I didn't even realize it was him. I actually. didn't know it was him until I the end of the movie. Yeah. When I, I, I was the whole movie. I was trying to figure out who Daniel Craig was voicing. So I mean, I, I was I saw his name at the beginning of the movie, but I couldn't right. figure out who he was. I like the use of Tintin's hair. His hair was as pretty the sweet. Equivalent of Indiana Jones's hat. It was it was an impressive little quaff they had going on yeah. too. Like it looked pretty realistic. So, um, did everyone see it in three D? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Three D. I you know for the most part I didn't notice too much, but I think you know that sequence at the end that we were talking about they used it pretty well. I thought like with the zip line and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, I he don't know, used was, one of the same ideas as Hugo too. That's where he had with like. Uh, like particles in the air. Yeah. Like it was interesting that they both decided to throw that in their movies. I mean, one thing I will say in, in terms of you talking about him going overboard, I don't agree with the actual set pieces. Like I, I like that he made them a little more cartoony, but in terms of the camera movement, I, I think once people get into a, a universe where they can do anything with the camera, sometimes you get, and this is even in live action movies now with CG. Well, I did. You get tons of like cameras that are like going everywhere. Um, there was a bit of a War of the Worlds feel at one point. I remember. I oh yeah, remember which what, I can't remember which shot, but I was like, I was worried a bit at the beginning, but that was it. Like, but I mean, for me, it's mainly like you know exterior shots where, or like a boat, it'll like go all over, and it's like. It, Anytime it feels like they're just doing it because they can, like, but then on the other hand, the single take Moroccan thing is like completely over the top, but is awesome because it's so over the top. Like, you know, when you're watching it, they're aware how over the top it is. I mean, yeah. And I think, you know, there's just this, there's still this need to sort of like, I need to feel like there is some sense of danger, some, like, urgency going on in in the the scene. And if that's lost, then I'm kind of like, well, okay, I'm watching something that's kind of fun, but I'm not invested in it, I guess. And some of them had See, it and some of them didn't. I, I agree kind of, but not totally, because in a movie like this, you would never, ever get the main, like, young adult character killed. Right, but I as mean, I mentioned, there there are still elements of danger here that kicked it up a notch from what I would expect from like a kids usual kids movie, I guess. I mean, I I guess the fact that he's put in grave danger more often than usual, like the I like the scene after the plane crashes and he's slowly sliding towards the prope- propeller blade, right? Um, stuff like that. I mean. Would have liked to have seen Spielberg, you know, take a chance and just have him be pushed right into the blade, just just to uh, take that mix it up and... a little bit. But <laughs> yeah, I think it would have been too close to indie, you know. Yeah, it, w- it wouldn't. That's true. Wouldn't work. The the movie about the archaeologist teacher. 
He is a fantastic <laughs> archaeologist and professor. <laughs> That's true. All right. So, but I mean, you can you can think now, looking back at Indy Four, the um, aliens and the swinging with the monkeys, and if that was done like this, might have been a little more forgivable mm-hmm. for people because it would have not been as well. Oddly, that that's. Fe- that swinging monkey scene is exactly why Tintin exactly. should be motion capture because it would just be that all over again. Yeah, and it's kind of a good point, like because obviously the first three Indiana Jones movies, you know, there wasn't CG and stuff like that to worry about. But then the fourth one, <laughs> now CG is there. It's a tool he can use for his set action set pieces, and sometimes he can't resist just you know pushing it a little bit farther than maybe he should. I, you know. Well, LaBeouf had a lot to blame in Indy 4. So. I well, still I, think one, a big problem with Indy 4 was the choice of filming it in his, like, the Yanish style from the, from the 90s and 2000s rather than the original style of the first three movies. Like, visually, it doesn't match the first three, I would say. Yeah, that's kind of true. <clears throat> I actually caught part of it on tv like this week and it just you can as soon as you see it you can pick up that it looks different than the others but again it's like you know it's quite a a span of time in between as well so i don't know uh all right so final thoughts what are you guys going to give uh tintin out of four stars i'll give it a 3.5 out of four i'll give it a big four 3.5 for me three from me Oh, solid three, but a three. 